All right. So we have a massive crowd here on Israeli News Live on our live broadcast. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway. All right, guys. Uh, tonight, um, last week, like I said, I did the teaching. And when I did, I was doing that on 1 Corinthians 11. I just messed it up. I messed it up mainly because I just got the revelation on part of it there, and I had not finished studying it out. As a result, I kind of did, I, I just, I went, I just didn't do a good job. Let's just put it like it is. I didn't do it the right way. So I, I went back, I prayerfully sought the Lord to do this right. And uh, what you see on your screen here, this is the message that I did, and I corrected it. Now you will know the truth. Um, I go into it in depth here and that the whole part about 1 Corinthians 11, uh, it is truly a redemption message, but I was getting everything mixed up because of the covering, the, the head, the kephale, et cetera. Uh, part of this is an analogy and the other part, he's, he's showing that the fact that the that uh, the man comes from, or the woman comes from the man, the man comes from Christ, you know, going down through the creation, and then he sums it back up. But when I tried to bring it out in this teaching here, I just didn't do a good job. So I went back, I redid it. This is the one that I did afterwards. And um, I quite frankly feel like it's probably one of the best messages I've ever done. Uh, so uh, if you haven't seen it, that's the correction for last week. Uh, definitely come. And the reason we had so many people last week, too, is me and Yana were on a live broadcast. We shared the link that we were going to be here. And so a lot of people came in. That's, that's why we had so many people last week. Uh, Yana is in Tennessee right now. I had to come down to Florida to take care of some things. That's why we didn't do our broadcast today. Uh, but we certainly did want to do it, and I know it'll be even better next week because she'll be prepared for that. Um, here's, though, is what I want to go into, and I'm going to... Zechariah, and uh, Rhonda, did, did it go to the scripture of Zechariah as I clicked on that? I'll, well, you've got, I'll do the I'll, stop share and then I'll reshare that. That way, each time I know it goes to it. That way, we don't have to worry about it. All right, now I know we're on it. You're there. Yes. Okay. So here's what I wanted to. I'm I'm going to go in a couple of directions tonight, but uh, this is the. I'm wanting to kind of start going back and correcting some of these mistakes that we've done in Zionism and. Uh, so I figure if I go into that, put us down here at the bottom, then uh, we can look at this biblically because there are prophecies that people apply to modern days that Jesus was fulfilling 2,000 years ago when he came here. Uh, and this is one of many that I, I used to use it quite frequently myself as well in Zechariah chapter Eight uh, and verse 23, but I'm going to back up just a little bit here. Verse 21 down, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts, and I will go also. That's really a kind of interesting passage right there to think about when I go to share some things with you. Uh, In fact, let me go back to verse 20. That'll, that even there is good too. That's very important. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, it shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and the inhabitants of many cities and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go speedily to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many peoples and mighty nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. 
and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, in those days it shall come to pass that 10 men shall take hold out of all the languages of the nations shall even take hold of a skirt of him that is a Jew saying, we will go with you for we have heard that God is with you. Nowadays, this particular passage has been applied to a future coming, uh, a future time, and that the 10 people of the nations are taking a hold of the Jewish people by the, by the skirt, saying, we've heard God's with you and we'll go with you. A lot of that has to do because of when you get to the last sentence, Melecha imhem, we will go with you, is in the plural. Imhem is with you, as in you all, as we would say in the South. We all gonna go with you all out there. Kishamanu, because, that word ki means because. Shamanu, shema means to hear, but the nun vav at the end right there, let me. I'm going to kind of colorize this to make it a little bit easier to see and understand. This part right here, then we call this, the, that part of the word is called nu in green. That's the we. Shema means here, or we have heard, because we have heard Elohim imhem. We have heard God is with, there's the word with by itself, just im, and then the word chem means you, plural, it's, and that's how we know that. But when you first read it, the hiziku, the hiziku is this word right there, okay, says, uh, let's see, we will take a hold, that's what that is, bekanaf, and that is a plural for the we right there, that little letter there, but if they're going to take a hold of the wing, like the sleeve, just to grab you by the sleeve, they're going to take the hold of a ish, one man. Now, I find this fascinating in light of what I taught in that message I just showed you, what ish really means and what isha really means. Ish and Isha shows the fire of Almighty God. They're going to take a hold of the wing of Ish Yehudi or a Jewish man or a Judean man, but it's only one. It's not, if it was to say, if we were to be looking at this as a prophecy that the Gentile people are going to take a hold of the tzitzit, a lot of people translate that as the tzitzit, of a Jewish man or the Jewish men of Israel, it would have to be Ishim. It would have to have two more letters after this part in dark blue to be a prophecy as a whole. So the fact that he's a Judean man is the clear indication that it's only one man they're going to take a hold of that of his wing so to speak they use that as the hem of the garment but it literally means the sleeve of his garment so it's not even his seat and by the way in the hebrew matthew there is a separation between that part and the seat it literally uses the word seat in the hebrew matthew but not on this particular verse because it's actually has a fulfillment over there. But the part about we will go because we have heard that God is with you, that is so simply easy to see. And I'm going to take you to Matthew 14 and show you. Then they that were in the ship came and worshiped him, saying of a truth, you are the son of God. And when they were gone over, they came into the land of Gennesaret. Or you could say the Galilee. But he noticed he's saying the land 
of Gennesaret. And when the men of that place had knowledge of him, they sent out into all that country round about and brought unto him all that were diseased. Notice though, they sent to all that country round about. Hold that thought. And, by, and besought him that they might only touch the hem of his garment. And as many as touched him were made perfectly whole. But that knowledge of him went to all the country round about. Well, look at Isaiah, look at Zechariah. And it said here, this shall yet come to pass that there shall come peoples and all the inhabitants of many cities. And the inhabitants of one city shall go to another saying, let us go up speedily. And that's exactly what happened. Now, it's actually a compound fulfillment because the prophecy basically just sets the time frame. It doesn't set the full spectrum of everything that we have here. It sets the time frame. Because if you look into the book of Acts, we actually see that this is fulfilled in Acts as well. And there, this is when we go, we see in the day of Pentecost was fully come. There were all in one accord in one place. And suddenly they came around about from heaven, a rush and mighty wind. It filled all the house where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire. And it sat upon each of them. Now, this is what I find interesting in itself. The tongues like as a fire. Why do I find that interesting? Because in Zechariah, they're going to take a hold of the wing of a, the wing, let's see, big enough, get the right spot there, of a ish, the dark blue. That's the fire. There's your fire right there. The yod in the middle there represents God, and then the aleph and the sheen represents the word fire. We translate it man, but really the word Adam is man, not ish. So anyway, we come back to Acts. And there were dwelling at Jerusalem. This word in Greek is not Jews, it's Judeans. Judeans, devout men, out of what? Every nation under heaven. Now, when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed, marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? How hear we every man in our own tongue wherein we were born? Corinthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia and in Judea, Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia, Phy, uh, Phryg I can't even say that word, Phrygia, Pamphylia in Egypt, parts of Libya about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Judeans and proselyte. Everywhere you see the word Jews is Judeans and not the word Jews, just Judeans and proselytes, Cretes, Arabians, we do hear them speak in our own tongue the wonderful works of God. All right, now they're all amazed. Some are thinking that they're full of new wine. We read, you know, you could, we don't take the time to read all of this. But Peter tells them, they're not drunk as you think they might be, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. I'll pour out my spirit in the last day, and your young men and your uh, your young men shall see dreams and your old men shall have visions, right? He tells about that prophecy. But what's interesting is he says here, when you get down to verse 36, he says, therefore, let all 
the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked at when their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord God shall call. Now, going back to Zechariah, it says here, they take a hold of the wing of a Jewish man or a Judean man. And they say, we have heard that God is with you. Now, the interesting part is they're not saying to the Judean man that God is with him. In this case, they are saying, Nelecha, okay, Imchem, we will go with you because Ki Shemanu, we have heard, Elohim, Imchem. They took a hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew in a totally different place. And they don't say anything about the Jewish man that God is with him. Then it goes into a complete plural. That's where you have situations of one sentence is a fulfillment at one time. The next sentence is Acts chapter 2. The first sentence is Matthew 14, right there, when he fulfilled the part about and all the people come out from all the different places and stuff, and they touched him. Touch, you know, they wanted to touch his touch his arm. They wanted to touch his garment in some way. But after all this happened, it began to grow and grow and grow until it became such a movement that after he had died and the day of Pentecost came around and then the first original uh, apostles, 120 were in the upper room that truly believed they were filled with the Holy Spirit in so much to where the rest of them says, we hear God is with you. Who's the with you? That is the group. Now that is the group of Israelites in whom God is actually with. So it's not that the people are going to take the tzitzit of a Jew today and say, we'll go with you for we heard God is with you, but rather it was the house of Israel taking a hold of those that knew, they, in other words, they knew that God was with them. It doesn't even say that they're going to take a hold of the hem of their garment. It didn't say that at all about them. The only mention of taking a hold of the hem of his garment was a single man that they're going to do that to. And according to uh, Zechariah 8, that happens to be people that came from all the different cities round about and came down there. They take a hold of his garment. That's a fulfillment all on its own. But something happens though, because that ish, that very, that very one that is the ish, Yehudi, they want to take a hold of his wing, so to speak. Which if you go to that message that I did, and I looked at that redemption, and then what I did is I took, took you guys and I went back to Genesis. Now this is where it's very important because it actually dovetails with that very message, right? We go back to Genesis, and I think that was chapter 2, if I remember right. We'll go down and see. Yep, it is. It is exactly from here. The rib which the Lord God had taken from the man made he a woman. And then I showed the, the 1 Corinthians 11. And I'll just use that again because we're going to kind of tap into all of this right here. and We're going to bring it all back together at one lick here. So let's, makes it sound like ice cream, doesn't it? But it's not. 
All right, 1 Corinthians 11, here we go. All right, so that the head of every man is Christ. And that word being source, that head of that man or that source of that man is Christ. And the source of the woman is the man. That's Genesis right there. Okay, there you go. See, and the rib which the Lord God made had taken from the man and made ye a woman. So she came out of him. But here's why, here's where, here comes this part of Zechariah. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. He shall, right there in purple. But that two letters there is fire. Aish. She is, she shall be called woman because why? She was taken, because she was taken out of man. Huh. That's interesting. Because here it says she was taken from man because ki meish. But here, when it says, and the Lord God, which he took the rib, the Lord God had taken from the man, and he made a woman. Taken from what? Min ha'adam. That one said he takes it from the man. This one down here says he takes it from the man. And it's two different words. Whoa. Why? Why is it two different words? It's two different words because when he taken from min ha'adam, that's the rib. That's the physicality part of the man. The, because why? Man was taken from the dust of the earth and he formed that man and breathed in his nostrils the breath of life. But when he takes him from the earth and he takes that rib out of that man, that's the earthly side of it. Okay, made he a woman, but it's still though she's a Isha, and there's that fire again, and brought her into the man. And there he takes from the Ish, not a Adam, but a Ish, may Ish, And that is the Isha comes from that. There again, both their names in this case here comes from the word fire, but you take the Yod out of his name and the He out of her name and you have God. Then the next verse, verse 24, is what brings us back to Zechariah. Therefore shall a man, okay, not Adam, but a Ish, shall leave his father and his mother, aviv ve'etimo, and shall cleave unto his wife, ishto, and they shall be one flesh. That is a prophecy of Jesus Christ because he is that fire of God. He is the one she leaves and she then attaches that way through him. That is Zechariah 8. They, as it says here, Vehiziku. They will take a hold of the skirt or the wing. Vehiziku, Bekanaf, Ish. Yehudi. So that Ish is going to be in a Judean. And that Ish is the fulfillment of Genesis where he leaves his father and his mother and he cleaves unto his wife. And it is that man is a Ish because the woman was taken out of the Ish. So therefore she has to return back into the Ish. But in this case here, we're multiples, we're plurals, because so many people have come. So then we find out that God is with them, because, and who's the them? The 120 in the upper room. That's who the them is. 
And they want to know what to do to receive the what? This Holy Spirit that they had gotten. And as according to what Acts says, there appeared upon each one of them cloven tongues. Well, wrong chapter, get the right one. Hang on. I don't know why I'm in chapter nine here. Just want to make sure just in case there's a reason I put that up there. I don't want to lose it. So we'll come back to that if we need to. In chapter two, what was over them? Cloven tongues as of fire. Remember, Jesus Christ comes to redeem back his bride to himself. And he said, what in that day you will know that I am in you and you are in me. First, he says, you will know that I am in the Father, the Father is in me, and that I am in you and you are in me. There's Corinthians all over. And then, as I said to you, you know, this whole thing about this hair covering and stuff like that, what, what I found fascinating about that, too, was, was the mere fact that after he goes into that source part, then he says, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered. His, what the, he just told you what the head was. His head was Christ. The word his is italicized. Having head covered. He dishonors his head. Well, it could be his own physical head, but nonetheless, he still dishonors Christ by covering his head. But a woman that prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. And like I said, when I did the message in correcting this, it's like wearing a wedding band. In other words, when you and your husband are not one, Christ that is, you and Christ become one, that's why it actually applies to both men and women both there, because you dishonor your head. You're not one with him. And then he goes into the part about being shaven, as it is true. The woman that is shaven is the one that's taken prisoner, taken captive, right? But the fascinating thing that I didn't get into in that one message there when I first taught it was about her hair. All right. Also, too, and I, I did it on the other one because of the angels, right? Literally, the word because right here in the Greek language can be uh, what was that word? I looked it up and it was actually to avoid the angels. It's the fallen angels. And what is that? If you, in other words, if you're not one with Christ, those, angels, those fallen angels, they will go after you. In other words, these evil spirits. And oddly enough, you ever look at what Thomas says in here in the book that he wrote that they didn't put in the canon. I don't know if they didn't have it or what at the time. Who knows? But nonetheless, it didn't make it in. Thomas actually says, if an evil spirit sees a woman alone and not with her husband, he'll come after her. Vice versa. If a man is alone and not with his wife, he'll come after her. And he was using types and shadows as well as he described all this. Then you get into this part about her hair, right? Um, but it goes back to the source again. Neither, nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither are the woman without the man and the Lord. For as the woman is of the man, even so the man is also of the woman. In other words, Eve came out of Adam, and so Christ came out of Mary. Plain and simple, right? Then you get into this hair part, right? Her hair, as he says here, but if a woman have long hair, it is a glory to her, for her hair is given her for a covering. Do you know the word here, covering, is not katar? Up here in the earlier part, it's katar, katar. The katar is a divine covering. This here, this word that is used here, is just a natural covering. Not the word katad at all. So it's only an analogy. Doesn't matter if she cuts her hair or not. That's not the point. The point is being one with Christ. It's that 
coming back to him and Zechariah so beautifully showing that Christ would come and that it would be it would be that ish that they want they want to be able to not just touch him but to become one with him and then as they find, see here's the thing they were able to touch him they were able to get healed but the problem was even though they could do all of that, they still had not got that ish inside of them. So they find out later, oh, we hear God is with you. Well, it certainly isn't a bunch of Orthodox rabbis running around, you know, I'll never forget, I'm in Israel, we're in a cab, we're driving through the city, uh, coming from the airport, we've been out of town for a while, we're coming back and uh, as we're going along, it was so funny. The cab driver, he was a Jewish guy. And he points to the Chabad or the Orthodox Jews running around in black. He said, they look just like penguins. And I like to fell out, right? I never thought about that before. He said, but yeah, he said, look, they even waddle like a penguin. He said, look, I'm Jewish. I'm not making fun of them. I'm just telling you, but they look like penguins. I'm like, okay. Anyway, coming back though. They hear God is with you. So it's definitely not going to be the Orthodox community. It's not. They, do they have the law? Yes. I will give them the credit for having the law. They do have the law. They truly are the lawyers of the law. They know the law. And as Paul said, if you, you cannot serve two masters. And if you don't know that that's the law, all you got to do is read that book. They didn't let you get in there because Thomas tells you if they did, you know, he said he tells you it is the law. You can't serve two masters. You're either going to love Christ or you're going to love the law, whichever one you want, but you're not going to serve both. Anyway, I do know why I have this other acts up here. Let me come to it real quick now. Um, oh, that was actually something else. I didn't know if I'd go into, I, I think I'll tell you what, we've got a little bit of time left. I'm going to go ahead and touch on this too. Um, but there is something different. I don't want to go to Acts yet. There is Matthew 15, I believe. Yeah. Uh, just to strengthen what we're saying here. And behold, a woman came unto the came out of the same coast and cried to him, saying, have mercy on me, Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously, grievously vexed with a devil. <clears throat> but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. All right. The woman was of Canaan. But she comes to him. She's a Gentile seeking mercy. At the time, he's only sent to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. She comes. She worships him saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not me to take the children's bread and to cast it to dogs. And she said, truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat the crumbs which fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered and said, Unto her woman, great is thy faith. Be it unto thee, even as you will. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. Now, I bring this up because of the house of Israel to also prove that Acts chapter 2 was the house of Israel. And it also proves that when Jesus was there in Acts, uh, wait, I'm sorry, is it Matthew 14? And he went over there to the land of uh, Gennesaret. In the Hebrew Matthew, it actually says Syria. That's what I wanted to show you. He turned from there and saw two other brothers, James, John. Okay, wait a minute. they hastened, left their nets. All right. Then Jesus went around the land of Galilee, teaching their assemblies and preaching to them the good gift, that is, um, Evangelio and the kingdom of heaven, healing the sick of every disease among the people. So a report about him went into all the land of Syria. And they brought into him all those who were sick from various kinds of diseases, those possessed by demons, those who were terrified by an evil spirit, and those who shook and he healed them. Many followed him from Capoli 
in Galilee, from Jerusalem, Judah, and across the Jordan. But if he wouldn't do anything for the Canaan woman, then you realize those people that were not living in the land of Israel that were coming to him were the house of Israel. As he even sent the apostles out when he sent them out, I think it was 72 that went out. They came back saying, even the devils are subject unto us. He sent them only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So that as they say this thing about the 10 lost tribes, no, it's not 10 lost tribes. They were all found in that day. Uh, now, there is, and I still have not done the message yet. I don't know if I'll do it here, if I'll do it independently this weekend, maybe even. I want to deal with Romans, uh, not only chapter 11, but chapter 9. Chapter 9 quotes the remnant of Israel that returns. Chapter 11, Paul says, thus will fulfill the scripture, all Israel shall be saved. And I used to think that maybe this was already all fulfilled. But now when I discovered the, uh, the, the book of Peter that was not published in our Bible, and he goes deeper into the fig tree, it appears to be that the house of Israel, as Isaiah said, was a remnant. And that's what was fulfilled in Acts chapter 2. But before it's all over, he deals with the rest of Israel in this last day. And it's going to come at a time when deception is in this land like never before. And by the way, this Christ, when it talks about false Christ, false prophets, it goes a lot deeper than just a man or a false antichrist figure. I need to probably teach that separately, but that's something that I've been, the Lord led my heart to that. We're looking at Matthew 24. Uh, let me just see if that's this one here. No, I don't even think I have it up here right now. Matthew 24 is where Jesus talks about the false Christ and false prophets. And he uses a, a very interesting verbiage in there. And I think it's, I looked at it in the Hebrew Matthew as well. Uh, talking about the inner chamber or the, um, if they you know, well, like when he says, they will say to you that he is, uh, he's in the desert, go not out. If he's in the inner chamber, what does he say? Believe it not. It has nothing about in or out, just believe it not. I have a whole different thought on what that really means. I won't go into that right now because it's very deep, very important, very serious message I need to deal with separately. Um, let's so real quick, I want to touch on Isaiah 17 for about the next 10 minutes here. In Isaiah 17, this is what we're about to see. Israel is on the war path. And Damascus will definitely be a ruinous heap. As the scripture says, it shall be a ruinous heap. The cities of Aror are forsaken. They shall be for flocks, which shall lie down, and none shall make them afraid. The fortress also shall cease from Ephraim, and the kingdom from Damascus. And the remnant of Aram, which is Syria, the remnant of Syria shall be as the glory of the children of Israel. I have a feeling it has a lot to do with like, in other words, the same things that happened to Israel is going to happen to them. Now, Ephraim actually is the house of Israel. It's just another term used for the house of Israel is Ephraim. Damascus had become a fortress for the house of Israel. Remember, they came from abroad to hear the message uh, on the day of Pentecost, and then they returned back, and it was the house of Israel, including from Syria. Now, Paul, when he was on his road to Damascus in chapter 9, 
It says here, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, he went into the high priest. Notice what Paul was planning on doing. He was only called Saul at that time, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. Went unto the high priest. I'm pausing on that because that's very, very important right there. He desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. There was no mercy. As he journeyed, he came near to Damascus. Do you realize, had Paul not been stopped by Jesus Christ, Isaiah 17 would have been fulfilled 2,000 years ago. But he was stopped because Jesus knew that wasn't the time. There was a fortress for Ephraim. That fortress was the kingdom of Damascus. Syria had given protection to the believers of Jesus Christ that were living there. They were a fortress for them. Paul was going there as Saul to slaughter them. Not just go there and bring them captive, but to slaughter them. And also bring prisoners. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. Suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell on the earth, heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Even though he was going after his believers, Jesus took it personally. And he said, who are you, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. That, that's interesting just in itself. I'm assuming the pricks, and let me look that up real quick. I'm assuming that's like a thorn bush, okay? Let me just, out of curiosity, I'm really, I'm curious because I got a different thought in my mind, so I just have to see for myself if that's what the case may be. Against the pricks. Okay, let's see. The point, that is a sting, uh, a prick, a sting. Figuratively, divine impulse, figuratively, a poison or a goad, which I know what a goat is, especially in Israel. That so it can make a real pretty flower, but it is a mean dog on a little thorny flower too. Um, I'll just kind of leave that one be. I'm not going to really go into that as of right now because I don't really know if I would be right in that. And I don't want to do the same thing I did last week, go into something and then regret not prayerfully really seeking that out. The point is though, Paul wanted to to, to destroy it. I'm focusing with an emphasis about he goes to the high priest to do it. Israel is on the verge of fulfilling Isaiah 17, but it's not just Israel alone. It's going to be the United States, or at least it represents the Christians of our nation that will go there to destroy Damascus. The only reason we know this is when we get to the latter part of the verse here, in verse 10, We'll read verse 9 with it. In that day shall his strong cities be as the forsaken places, which were forsaken from the children of Israel after the manner of woods and lofty forests. It shall be a desolation. That is Syria today. In that day shall his strong cities be as a forsaken places. And by the way, Damascus is the oldest remaining city, period, on the planet. That's what I'll say. I don't want to say period and make that an absolute. This is what we hear from scholars. So I'm assuming that it's true. It's never been destroyed. 
but they set the stage for you. The strong cities shall be as forsaken places which were forsaken from before the children of Israel after the manner of woods and lofty forests, and it shall be a desolation. Syria is definitely a desolation. Then he says in verse 10, for you have forgotten the God of thy salvation. And thou hast not been mindful of the rock of thy stronghold. Now, me personally, I have believed that that verse there is dealing with the God of thy salvation being Israel. The rock of thy, mindful of thy rock of thy stronghold, because Jesus Christ, we know, according to Paul, is the rock. Jesus Christ is the rock. They're not mindful. Not saying that they don't believe in him. They're just, they're not mindful. Their mind is not, as, as I heard this one uh, preacher from South Africa say, uh, Theo, a wonderful brother, he said, I uh, passed away some years ago, but he said one time, I'll never forget it. He said, he said, I love when the scripture says God is mindful. And he says, what does mindful mean? He said, that means his mind is full of us. And I thought, wow, that is amazing. But in here he says, you have not been mindful of the rock of your stronghold. Their mind is not filled with Christ. And because of that, they can easily go and plant pleasantness and did set up with slips of a stranger. If you look right there, Uzamurat Zar Ti Zaranu. The word Zad right here is the word stranger. Now, the planting here of that stranger is this right here in the middle, Zara. Zara is seed. You went in amongst them and you planted a false vine, so to speak, we would use as an analogy. Like a Nephilim race, like an Isis in the middle of good people there. Now, granted, even though I do believe because of the verbiage here, you're not, you have forgotten the God of your salvation, which clearly is Israel. They've totally forgotten who their God really is. And the Christians are, they don't have their mind fully on Christ. That's how this could happen. Could it be though that it's speaking about the house of Israel that has been there so long? that they're the ones that forgot about it and they're the ones that have not been mindful of Christ and that's how all this happened? It could be. It could be. It could be either way. And that's something that not long ago I began to consider. Could it be the other way as well? And it's possible. In the day of planting, you did make it grow and in the morning, you did make thy seed to blossom. A heap of bow bows in the day of grief and desperate pain. Because why? She's about to be a ruinous heap. And truly, when that happens, you will see, and I didn't put it up here, but I'm going to put it up here now real quick. You will actually see, in closing, I'll say this. You will see Daniel. You're going to see Daniel chapter 11, and it's the very verse. I've never gone through all of Daniel because God just has not revealed all of this to me. Okay, but it's this one part, verse 40, that I really feel strongly about. Verse 39 is interesting in itself as well. And he shall deal with the strongest fortress with the help of a foreign God. That's just Completely insane, in my opinion. A foreign God. Mm. Whom he shall acknowledge shall increase in glory, and he shall cause them to rule over many, and shall divide the land for a price. Now, this goes back to, he stands up place, shall honor the God of strongholds, but a God of whom his fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and costly things. It almost to me sounds like the United States. 
Just a thought. I'm not saying that it is. By no means, I don't mean to say it is. It's just interesting. And he shall deal with the strongest fortress and with the help of, by the way, though, they divide that land for a price. Right there. You remember when Great Britain goes in there, they conquer the uh, Turkish Empire, Ottoman Empire is conquered. And what they do? A God whom his fathers knew not. In other words, they did believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God, and they were a Christian-believing nation at one point. But then they go in there and they overthrow the land. They divide it up for a price. And they, and they cause them to rule over many. And they ruled over all these people. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south, Im Melech Hanegev, which is the king of the Negev desert, the only king that that could be would be an Israeli leader. And the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots, with horsemen, and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow as he passes through. Now, the British crown set up all these lands, but this king of the north, Melech Hatsifon, literally means a hidden king. The king of the Negev Desert, obviously an Israeli leader, makes a covenant with a secret king that we don't know about, and he goes over the top of him with his chariots, with his horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries, and that is Baratzot, plural. They don't enter into Israel. This is not about a battle against Israel. It's about a battle against the Middle East. And he goes in there and overflows. And that's why I get in the, my mind the C-130s filled with the chariots inside and drop them down. Uh, I mean, who knows? Though? He comes with his chariots. Maybe the chariots are the spacecraft as well, because uh, that is an analogy used and believed to be something when we get the wheel within the wheel in Ezekiel, that that could be some type of craft. And from what I hear, they're going to use reverse engineered craft in this war. So it's another thought. Never have really said anything about that. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining us here on our Thursday night broadcast. You guys normally don't see this here on Israeli News Live. It's either on Patreon or you get to watch it live right on the actual website, www.steven, S-T-E-V-E-N, Ben-Noon, B-E-N-N-U-N, dot com. Every Thursday night at 8 p.m. Eastern, you can join us live for this broadcast. Love to have you here. Last week, we had a little over, oh, no, know, about 30, 40 people, something like that, that joined in. I actually flubbed it up, believe it or not. And uh, that's when I did the retake of the video there that you guys saw at the beginning of this video here and where I shared where I made that mistake there. Uh, but listen, you have to be honest with people. You make a mistake, you correct the mistake, come back. We'd love to have you here live on Thursday nights. And if you don't catch it here, like you're seeing now on Israeli News Live, join our patreon.com forward slash Israeli News Live. And also, I wanted to share with you, we do need your help and your support in the work that we do here. Listen, without you, it just isn't possible. There's a lot of things going on, a lot of things happening, and we are trying to step it up a notch or two for you as well. Uh, and normally I would have Yana to today as well, but I'm in Florida. She's up in Tennessee. She wasn't able to come down uh, on this trip here, so we will pick up next Thursday with her as well, live here on Israeli News Live. But support the work. IsraeliNewsLive.org, our address... P.O. Box, uh, gosh, what is it, 156 Sunbright, Tennessee, uh, 37872. That's Stephen Benoon at P.O. Box 156 Sunbright, Tennessee, 37872. Thank you. Really sincerely, I thank you for your support, your help. It is definitely needed, and God bless you.